All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Cecil. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Aging Research Institute. Uh, welcome to our online Seminars in Aging program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which each of us are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Firstly, a little housekeeping regarding Zoom. Uh, at the conclusion of the talk, we'll have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions, you can submit them throughout the seminar using the chat function, uh, which can be opened using the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Today, we'll be hearing from Associate Professor Bianca Bridgeneff uh, and Joe Antoniadis from the National Aging Research Institute. Bianca is the Divisional Director of our Social Gerontology Department, and Joe is a Research Fellow at NARI. Their research interests include uh, dementia and mental health in culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And today they're going to be presenting cultural diversity in the aged care workforce, uh, current implications, for future uh, implications and future opportunities in two parts. Uh, so first up, we have Joe. Uh, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. All right, I'll just get my thing up here. All right, so um, thank you all for um, being here today. I'm going to present Hero uh, Behind the Curtain, Multicultural Workers uh, in Cold Dementia Care. And just a note, uh, when I say cold, I refer to culturally and linguistically diverse uh, communities. So you hear me say that a lot, just so you know. So... So cold Australians make up approximately one third of Australia's population um, and research shows that uh, people from cold backgrounds are often uh, receiving a delayed diagnosis of dementia, have lower rates of um, uh, prescription and use of uh, dementia medication, have delayed access to services, including specialists, and have lower rates of service uptake, including long term care. So some of the underpinning reasons identified for this delayed access to dementia services include the lack of awareness of where to seek services, um, lack of culturally appropriate services, low English proficiencies, um, different cultural understandings of ageing, cognitive decline, stigmatising attitudes towards dementia, and also the role of family in enabling diagnosis and care. So not only do cold clients face challenges in accessing services, service providers equally face challenging and actually meeting the needs of their cold clients. So a concept that has been explored in the literature, not in relation to aged care, but in relation to uh, rural health, mental health, and also in developing countries, is the concept of boundary crosses. This concept was coined by uh, Kilpatrick and colleagues in 2009. And boundary crosses are those that straddle two or more fields. Uh, for example, um, you know, having an intrinsic knowledge or lived experience of uh, living in a certain community or being from a certain background, um, paired with a profession, um, and they use this to address community needs. So they leverage their understanding of uh, the community to broker relationships and form partnerships to facilitate engagement and improvement of whatever it is they're looking to do in their communities. Uh, this concept is not, as I mentioned, been widely used in aged care, yet um, as both... Uh, the older population in Australia, as well as, as uh, health and aged care providers are increasingly growing multicultural. Uh, it's quite important to, uh, to examine what providers actually do uh, at, the, um, at the, the nexus of culture, dementia, health and aged care. And this is what we aim to do with this particular uh, work. So underpinned by the concept of pound uh, boundary crosses, we examined, uh, we aim to examine the experiences of multicultural service providers working with cold communities to uncover what strategies are employed to facilitate access and provide care to cold people with dementia and their families. So I should mention that uh, our data is part of the Moving Pictures project, which is a large national project aiming to raise awareness of dementia in cold communities using film and media. And we've conducted um, uh, the, the presentation today is based on uh, 27 in-depth um, 
video recorded interviews with service providers working with cold clients across Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. Interviews uh, were conducted uh, both in language and in English um, as we interviewed people from uh, different cultural backgrounds um, and uh, we translated and transcribed uh, interviews for Burton and then we did a thematic analysis. Hi, Joe. We're just having a little trouble with your your slides. Are they not moving along from your main one? Um, is it a delay, perhaps, or maybe? Can you see what the problem is on your end? No, I'm up to demographics. Right. What are you up to? We're still on uh, hero behind the curtain. Your your title screen. Uh, perhaps you could try um, stop sharing your screen and starting again. Oh, I'm sorry. It looked all fine here. I apologize profusely. <laughs> I'll try again. Are you seeing my screen now? Uh, it hasn't come up yet. I think there might be a bit of a delay. Okay, I'll just see. Can you see it now? Uh, yes, so it's come up. Um, we're viewing the presenter view. Okay, so I'll just try display settings. Just bear with me for a minute. There you go. Did that work? Yes, we're on your methods page now. And you're not seeing my presenter view? No, normal right view. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to move things around a little bit because it came up differently. For the first time in a long time, I'm at Nari, so it's just a little bit different. <laughs> so um, I'll just move my thing here. There we go. Just bear with me for a second. Okay, so um, I did the methods, and I'm, am I moving along now? Moving along, yes. We're on Excellent. I'm so sorry. I had these, all these beautiful pictures. Anyway. So be it. Uh, all right. So uh, in terms of the demographic details of our sample, we had a wide, wide varieties of providers, all of whom regularly worked with uh, uh, people from cold communities and mostly identified as being from an, uh, another ethnic background, with only two identifying as uh, being from an English speaking background. I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, I should just mention those that were from an English speaking background actually also spoke were bilingual, so as, as a minimum. So they, they worked with cold clients in, in language as well. Um, so um, just a little bit basic uh, demographic. So, you know, we had uh, more females uh, relative to males. The average age was 50.3 years of age. Um, and uh, there was a wide range in the number of years in practice uh, from 2.5 years to 31 years with the average of being um, 17, uh, sorry, 14.7. And these are some of our lovely providers down the bottom there. So uh, through the thematic analysis, four overarching themes emerged, all of which related to the reluctance of cold communities in engaging with services and what are the strategies that the service providers use to circumvent uh, this reluctance to facilitate uptake of care and essential services. And these included um, uh, stigma, and shame, stigma, shame and language, building trust, knowing the boundaries, system navigation and cultural uh, brokers. So uh, it did not come as a, as a surprise that stigma was described as one of the most pervasive barriers to accessing care, uh, because in some languages, even the word dementia carries uh, negative connotations, uh, as was highlighted in this uh, quote here. Dementia in Chinese means that you're a bit silly or stupid, and that was mentioned, that was uh, described by um, a manager in ethno-specific aged care facilities. Others described uh, that accessing services could be considered weak and shameful and also discussed how culturally derived idea, ideals of care being provided within the family presented a barrier in itself uh, due to concern that the concerns that the community might frown upon families who weren't caring for their relatives within the family unit. 
So clearly stigma remains a significant challenge within most communities, uh, not only to the person with dementia, but also the wider families, uh, which impacts their engagement in services and also getting initial diagnosis even. So in the clinical encounter uh, where diagnosis were being dispensed, providers also explained um, that they tried to overcome stigma by avoiding translations that could carry such negative connotations. Um, and where this was not possible, many actually opted to use English terms like dementia or Alzheimer's to avoid these stigmatized connotations, uh, which in accordance to some of the participants uh, allowed call families to be uh, more, um, ready to sort of accept the diagnosis. Uh, so um, that was just a quote from one of our geriatricians. However, just as participants sought to bring clients into the space of biomedicine, they, they also stepped into the, their client's world, often using languages, uh, using language in a bid to sort of render dementia understandable within the family's worldview. For example, some participants used terms such as demented or suffering, which has been criticized in the literature uh, as being um, you know, um, stigmatizing in itself. However, um, these participants felt they used their insider knowledge of the stigma that um, were in their communities to balance, balance between dementia friendly language technically precise uh, clinical terminology and also uh, colloquial expressions to convey the diagnosis to clients and families in non-stigmatizing, but also culturally uh, sensitive and accurate manners. So for example, um, if, the pers if the person has dementia, you have to adapt the diagnosis and you have to change yourself in a way uh, to um, interact with the dementia demented patient. It is not just the patient who suffers, it is the carer, it is the family, I have to treat the family too. Communication was identified as integral to um, building trust between providers and clients. And providers stressed the importance of crossing boundaries and working across um, different cold organizations and health organizations in order to raise awareness of dementia and to um, establish relationships of trust between cold clients and service providers and thereby facilitating access to services when and where these are, uh, were needed. So as one of our dementia consultants uh, described, my aim is to work in a very collaborative manner with different community organizations out there. The purpose is to work in a collaborative manner with all of them so that together we can serve the community, break the stigma attached to the disease and help people access the support services. Moreover, our participants also highlighted that communication um, was uh, integral uh, to providing to building trust between the provider and the client. So to un overcome preconceived ideas and fears harbored by clients uh, about the disease and, and the concept, uh, providers emphasized the importance of building um, relationships uh, of trust by engaging uh, in the language uh, of the clients where at all possible. So the perfect system would be one where the service provider uh, provides the service in that language so you can create a relationship with that person. Um, now, this was quite important um, because we found that ethno specific services describe not only how they build this trust and, an on, uh, and the ongoing relationship with clients, but also provided, a, in some cases, a single entry point into a wide range of services, taking some of the stress out of actually dealing uh, with what can be an otherwise confusing and very fragmented age care system. So the, per, the client just had to call from one place and they could then help them uh, help connect them with all the different services and give them advice. So as our, our one of our community liaison officers from the Italian community described, we can make this application via the internet to my aged care. So they can access, access home care packages or social groups or even uh, periods of relief like respite care. Further, uh, our data uh, tells, showed us that participant felt um, that much of the reluctance uh, to utilize aged care services was a response to bureaucratic and technical language which is often used by government services and healthcare professionals. 
Um, and they reported that older people from ethnic minority groups frequently found really difficult to uh, understand um, and even and come to terms with. So our uh, participants ended up being cultural brokers who could then interface uh, between their clients um, and their uh, cultural and linguistic needs and also the care, uh, care services to assist with the access and navigation of the aged care system. So as uh, the, uh, we had an Indian dementia consultant who described that they feel more comfortable when it comes from a person from their community who speaks their language and explains it to them in a very simple, easy to understand manner. In addition, uh, according to our uh, participants, family were also reluctant to utilize aged care services due to concerns that uh, aged care providers or staff might behave in ways that are not culturally sensitive to the needs of, you know, often it will be a parent or uh, a partner. Um, so to overcome this, participants uh, and providers in our study described how they took the greatest of care in taking the social history in order to actually be sensitive to the needs of the person coming into their care. And this could include things like um, allocating staff who spoke the language of the client, serving meals that were culturally appropriate, making sure that, you know, a, a, a male wasn't providing, you know, bath and body works to females, all those sort of things that could potentially be at odds with the person's culture. And generally being sensitive to the cultural and individual needs of their clients are really very patient centered. I, so this is a clinical direct diet and aged care facility. We take a really strong, a really strong social history so that we can manage individuals, uh, individuals' care needs according to what they're used to and their backgrounds. Just, you know, a consultation, a constant education, a constant open communication between the care team and relatives and the family and the individual. That is really important. Um, so in terms of uh, while they, you know, took over all these new roles and really became an integral part to uh, the family and the client, providers also uh, described that one of the most difficult situations faced by many cold families is actually the decision to place a loved, one's, loved one into uh, in, uh, living with dementia into a residential aged care. But many highlighted why there is a paucity of residential aged care services for cold. Ethno-specific residential aged care providers described a range of strategies that they used to allay family members' guilt and gain their trust, which included, as I described, cultural matching. They also had like an induction period for persons entering the care, um, similar to the first, you know, first few days of school, uh, and, uh, and providing services that matched the needs of the clients. They also said that it was important for families to be able to see that the client actually was happy in their new environment when returning for visits and emphasized to the family that their role was to support and strengthen the family relationships rather than replacing them, thereby knowing the boundaries by taking care of the tasks that the families were struggling with. For example, uh, as described by this aged care uh, professional, we take care of the dirty jobs and you can enjoy the beautiful time with your family not doing these dirty jobs. But we always said we cannot take over your position uh, as the son or the daughter or the daughter-in-law. We can just be the hero behind the curtain. So I uh, am to sort of to wrap it up into um, our findings in relation to the impact of stigma and shame. Um, of you know, service use and, and getting a, a diagnosis of dementia was not surprising and resonates with the literature. However, some really interesting findings um, and in some, some cases really constant strategies that people use to tackle um, these challenges they faced when engaging with uh, cold clients included things like changing the vernacular used to describe and discuss dementia, provide services in languages, in language where at all possible, and using their own uh, cultural background as a way to bridge, um, you know, build relationships and an ongoing uh, rapport and trust with, cult, uh, with clients and communities. And importantly, and this stood out to me very much so when I was looking at all these interviews, not only with, uh, as I'm talking about the, the um, providers, but also the 113 interviews we've shown with carers, provide a one-stop shop, which helps um, clients navigate the system. 
um, and act as cultural brokers uh, between cold organizations and communities to establish this trust uh, and make sure that clients are happy to take services that they need when they need them. And of course, provide services that are culturally appropriate and respectful. And as uh, the last um, quote highlighted, be the hero behind the curtain when these families face these new challenges. So in conclusion, aligning with the concept of boundary crosses, as I described at the beginning, uh, beginning many ethno-specific services act as cultural brokers who provide unique and culturally appropriate wraparound uh, care uh, that leverages off their personal, cultural, um, social and professional capacities uh, to assist clients navigate a system that could otherwise be very confusing and fragmented. These efforts translate into a model of care um, that can be well integrated across health, aged care and social services. And it's also a model that facilitates social and community development through building trust and rapport with communities uh, and across community organizations. For these reasons, uh, um, the role of the ethnos, ethnic services and their workers I perform is multidimensional, as you can probably pick up on, also very complex. However, unfortunately, um, they're quite under-recognized for this work, which involves a whole suite of things, including education, advocacy, negotiation, navigation, and emotional engagement, and so much more. Um, for these services are, are for many case, for many a lifeline for carers and families, and provide a really unique bottom-up model of care integration that is underpinned by the needs of the community they serve, and thereby supporting and empowering families in their journeys with dementia. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, um, and just an acknowledgement. Uh, to my team, um, Bianca works on there, uh, and our uh, team at Curtin, and all the other lovely people who have been helping. And yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen. So I think I'm up next, um, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. And um, Jess, I'll just ask you to jump in. Um, to make sure that uh, the right screen is being shared, just to confirm yeah. that. So I'm just moving on to, right. So are you seeing the full screen or the presenter view? Uh, we're seeing the presenter view. Brilliant, okay. Now? All good. All good, brilliant, okay. Right, well, thank you everybody. My name is Bianca Bridgenath and um, I'll be talking about who will need care in the future and the projected growth of Australia's older migrant populations and the implications for ethno-specific aged care services. So just to kickstart us, uh, we know that Australia is in a demographic transition where we've got uh, concomitantly an aging population and increased migration. So in grappling with uh, an older and increasingly multicultural country, uh, we know lots of things in the evidence base. Uh, we know a lot about the uh, history of migration and immigration policy in Australia over the last uh, 150 odd years. So uh, things like, uh, I guess, uh, in the early um, 20th century, the sort of 10 pound bombs that came to Australia, then transitioning very much to uh, Southern European migrants coming in uh, post-World War II, and then uh, increasing um, sort of intake of migrants from Asia, in particular Vietnam, and then more recently from uh, Southern Asia, in particular India. China is an interesting case, of course, because we've had Chinese migration to Australia for the past 200 odd years, um, but it's certainly accelerated in the last 20 or 30 years. So in this context of um, kind of migration from, from India, Europe and Asia, um, we also have several uh, gerontological studies that have examined aspects of individual aging in migrant populations. So we've had studies that have been published on migrant health, on the care and service needs and preferences of older migrants, on the care practices uh, within migrant communities, on language erosion and dementia, barriers to access and services, et cetera. So we know quite a bit about these things. What's missing, interestingly enough, is, very, is no population projection of what's actually happening for um, the next 30 odd years in Australia. So we know lots about the past and very little about the future. 
And so in this context of uh, population aging and increased migration and changing patterns of migration, uh, the aim of this study is really to understand what's going to happen to our older cohort populations um, between now and 2056. So to that end, uh, our study had three key research questions. First, how is Australia's population by birthplace and age um, 65 plus changed in recent years? How might it change into the future? And what are the drivers of, dem uh, of this projected change in terms of demography? I worked with a series of uh, demographers at the University of Melbourne and um, CEPA, which is the Center for Population Aging, Center for Ex Research Excellence in Population Aging Research. So my colleagues were listed at the front of the um, presentation. So I'm just looking back. So I'll acknowledge obviously the, the very hard work of uh, Professors Tom Wilson, Peter McDonald, Jeremy Temple, and Ariane Utomo as well. So back to the methods, they worked very, very hard. I'm not a demographer by training, but uh, they worked very hard on extrapolating data from the ABS from the years 1996 to 2016, and use that uh, data around migration um, to develop a fairly complex formula in order to do the modeling to project our population trends um, in aging and migra migration from 2016 to 2056. As you can see, the formula is listed there. It's fairly um, complicated. Please don't ask me to go through it because I'm really going to struggle there. But what we did try and do is account for, uh, I guess, population, uh, death, uh, people arriving into the country, people leaving the country, country of birth, um, sex, age, and uh, the points in time where populations start to age um, over the course. The study was obviously ethics approved, and I'm assured that it was, um, uh, they did a whole lot of technical decomposing and modeling to get the results we did. So to answer the first question, how is Australia's population by birthplace and age 65 changed in recent years? So what we, what we are seeing is a rapid increase in Australia's older population. Uh, there's quite a significant increase between 1996 and 2016. But if we look from 2016 onwards, we see there continues to be a rise, but this rise is not quite as dramatic as it was before. Nevertheless, there are about 3.8 million um, older Australians in Australia today. By 2056, that will be about 8.5 million people. So it is an increasingly aging society. When we look at these trends as well, we see that older migrants also start to comprise a growing cohort of um, the overall older population as well. But like I said, the growth into the future will not be as fast as it was previously. What we're looking at in terms of growth uh, between uh, 2016 and 2056 is a, is a basically difference of around about 5%. So in terms of the overall proportion of the population, older people will comprise uh, about 15% now and it'll go up to about 20% uh, into the future. So it's, it's a graduate, gradual rise in terms of percentage points, but numerically it's a big number because we're doubling basically from uh, 3.5 to 3.8 to 8.5 million. So those numbers are going up. And what we are also seeing with our overall older population is that it's going to be larger and it's also going to be much more diverse. So if we look at the population pyramid on the left from 2016, you can see it's a nice neat triangle shape. And if you look at it on the right from 2056, it's looking a little bit more like a tent. And what we're seeing in terms of the colorful um, sort of bands in the middle uh, are greater representations of older people, mainly from Asia and Africa. That's where a lot of growth is starting to happen. But there are significant variations in this change. And so while overall we're seeing an increase in people from Asian born communities um, in our older population cohorts uh, and a diminishment of people from European born backgrounds, it's sometimes it's really important to actually kind of drill down a bit more um, to actually understand what's happening at an intercontinental level. So we just don't want to leave it at continental levels. 
we look at the European population here, we see some funny things happening in this, in this particular uh, diagram here. It's kind of, uh, 2016 is the peak, it's really big. And then by 2036, you sort of see the populations are getting a bit older and they're kind of becoming a bit more weighted towards the top, which is your older cohorts on the side. And then if you look at what's happening in 2056, it sort of seems to stabilize uh, a little bit across the board. So it's looking uh, a little bit different in its configuration. So to try and understand why you might have that kind of variation, it's again, not just like I said, intercontinental, what's happening. So here are some projections again from the ABS that we've done in terms of modeling. And we see kind of differences in estimates and projections moving out. Now it's a not a hugely busy table, but I won't go through all of it. There's two bits I really want to illustrate. Um, yeah, the first one being, if we look at the UK born population, what we see is that as a population group, it's steadily increasing, right? As a percentage of older people in Australia. On the other hand, if we look at people from Southern Europe, what we're seeing is it's kind of steadily increasing up until about 2026, and then it starts to decrease quite a bit. So we're seeing quite a, uh, quite a bit of differences in the country of birth and where people are and how they are aging. To put it another way, at a country level, here's, here's an illustration of what I'm getting at. So what we're looking at is into the future by 2056, we've got a fair few people who are from born in England who are aging in Australia, so migrated and are aging in Australia. On the other hand, we're seeing quite a significant transformation in older people who are born in Greece. And you can see that it's rapidly shrinking quite a bit. So it, it sort of, again, um, 2016 is the black and white bars. That's where, we're, where we were a few years ago. Uh, 2036, we see these populations are really uh, an older, old cohort, but they've shrunk a bit. And then if you look at what's happening in 2056, it's, it's shrunk even more. It's almost become like a needle. So uh, there are these transformations even within um, the continent, even at, within regions. Uh, and at a country level. So it's really important when we're doing these kinds of analysis to at least drill down to country of birth to see where changes happen. And I'll explain why uh, when we get to talking about the policy. So we look at what are the main demographic drivers of these projected changes. Uh, it's really three things. Um, increasing life expectancy as a result of improvements in public health, uh, as well as social and economic development. Uh, a history of uh, international migration uh, particularly skills-based migration into Australia, and cohort flow, which is basically a growing proportion of migrants who might have arrived at uh, during a working age uh, are aging in Australia as they uh, live their lives uh, in their new homeland. So what do these, what do these kind of changes mean in a, in a policy sense uh, and in a practical sense? So I'll talk about that a, a little bit more and spend some time focusing on that now. Uh, I guess some of the key findings from this modeling is that we've got a really uh, fast growth of the over 65 population between 1996 and 2016, with the over overseas born share increasing. And while we've got continued rapid growth uh, over the coming decades, it is a bit slower than it was. Uh, but what we're seeing is a shift in birthplace composition with regards to older migrant uh, groups. And we're, there's quite a, quite a significant shift happening where we're going to transition from uh, mainly European dominated to now being more Asian dominated by the mid-century. And the main demographic factor that's uh, affecting this is cohort flow. So this is really crucial data, I think, uh, in terms of understanding which languages and communities are going to need services into the future. And we need to think really critically about where, for example, our interpreting and translation services are at at the moment. And do we have enough capacity to meet need into the future? And if we need to bolster them, where do we bolster it? We also need to think critically around um, when we direct scarce and precious resources uh, with regards to which communities we would direct what to and for what reasons. So if we're thinking about raising awareness of dementia, we might target uh, Sort of emerging communities uh, such as uh, Indian communities, such as um, some Arab communities, etc. If we are thinking about care options, we might focus more on Greek and Italian communities. If we're looking at prevention, 
we might uh, address different um, arrival, new arrivals as well as they're thinking about who is coming in at a working age population and how they're going to age uh, in Australia. So that's uh, one implication for policy and service. I think this data also has really major implications for ethno-specific aged care providers, because the bottom line is that some will be obsolete, while others will need to develop and scale up into the future. And this is an issue both of equity uh, and access to make sure the right people get the right services at the right time when they need it. But it's also an issue of business continuity. So how will large ethno-specific providers, which to date have been uh, primarily geared around servicing uh, mainly Southern European communities for the most part, how are they going to um, transform their business uh, to respond to an increasingly uh, Asian aging population? So that's something I think that needs to be uh, considered a fair, a fair bit. Um, so in terms of further research, I think some of the critical issues that need addressing is um, how are we going to future-proof these ethno-specific services, um, or at least uh, assist them to transition to caring for other communities? How are we going to work with coal communities that currently lack access to ethno-specific care? Um, what are we going to, how are we going to, I guess, um, help them with their needs in the short term? What kinds of bridging um, solutions can we have while their um, well, ethno-specific expertise is built up in their communities? Or, um, and ultimately, what is a sustainable, culturally appropriate uh, model of care um, that is likely to work in the longer term? So how do we think about these sorts of things? And I know this is something that preoccupies both policymakers and researchers, as well as many services as well. But these are the sort of critical issues in my, in my mind. Um, mainstream aged care providers are certainly not off the hook. Uh, it's really important to emphasize that. They've got a mandate. Uh, both legislatively and policy-wise uh, through the Aged Care Act, through the Aged Care Standards, through the diversity framework and other policy documents, that they must be inclusive of all the Australian communities they serve. So this is not a, just a problem for um, ethno-specific communities to grapple with. In addition, we're dealing with an aged care workforce that it's one of the very few workforces in this country that is actually projected to grow. Uh, and it's got a triple in its current size to almost a million people by 2050. We know already that the HK workforce is uh, very culturally diverse. In fact, about 40% of recent employees in residential HK facilities are migrants mainly from India, Philippines, Iraq, and Sudan. Uh, given what this workforce composition is looking like and given what the demographic aging I um, outlined a bit earlier, we see that cultural matching is may be possible in some instances, but may not be possible in all. And therefore, we really need to think about how we're going to leverage a multilingual, multicultural workforce to build vulnerable connections between, uh, to build connections, sorry, between vulnerable and diverse groups, which is something we haven't really grappled with well enough in aged care. Diversity is often um, seen as something niche and continues to sometimes be framed as a problem with regards to a multicultural aged care workforce. And I think we've got to find better ways to harness uh, existing talent and capacity within that workforce. Uh, so having given the big spiel about what I, think need, what I think needs to happen in terms of both policy and services and implications for ethno-specific and mainstream providers, um, I better put a few caveats on the limitations of our research. So our research uh, has not accounted for I guess, the long-term impact of COVID-19. And by this, I mean, um, obviously migration has halted last year and this year and probably next year on account of COVID-19. So in terms of long-term modeling, uh, it hasn't had much of an impact on our modeling. It kind of gets flattened out over those long, longer terms. But what might happen is COVID-19 might prompt a rapid transformation um, or maybe a radical transformation of the government's approach to migration. Maybe the government might say, well, Right, we need heaps more migrants. So the government might say, no, sorry, we, we want to uh, limit migration. So if there is likely a change to migration policy, obviously that's going to affect the projections I've put forward today. The other shortcoming about the projections I've put forward today is that we haven't really accounted for the proficiency in English of um, the migrant cohort groups that I presented. And therefore, um, it might be that some communities um, 
very well versed uh, in English, very comfortable navigating the system, quite happy to live in uh, mainstream uh, residential aged care facilities, ac access mainstream services, and it's not a drama for them in any way at all, and they don't necessarily require ethno-specific care. Uh, that might be a reflection also of acculturation. That is uh, the time that they might have spent in Australia and uh, I guess uh, acclimatized to Australian ways of life, whatever those might be, uh, and have a certain familiarity with the cultures and societies and communities in which they live. And finally, the other thing that our, our, our projections haven't accounted for is the prevalence of dementia and language reversion that does happen uh, with dementia. And therefore, um, you know, we don't know that as, um, say, for example, um, second generation Greek communities age, uh, would they, if, if there is a high prevalence of dementia, do they revert back to English or will they revert back to Greek? We, we don't know that. And so in that extent, I mean, it's a, bit, a little bit like reading the tea leaves in terms of future modeling, but uh, I hope hopefully it's a bit more informed uh, than, than that. So that's some of the limitations of our work. Uh, but the, I guess the key conclusion is in, in bringing these issues to light and in framing these questions, both for researchers and policymakers to contemplate. I want to underscore this isn't a problem that's unique to Australia. It's a unique, uni, um, it sort of prevails across mo many migrant uh, receiving nations across the world, uh, such as UK, France, Germany, the US, Canada, and New Zealand. Everyone's grappling with the same issues. And so we've really got to do a lot more work uh, in this space uh, and future research that could be um, done also looks at um, at what age of migration do we see variations in later life well-being. Um, what are the implications that would happen um, in terms of intermarriage between overseas and Australian born populations or in terms of language proficiency, care preferences, um, and I guess how that might transform ethno-specific care. Uh, what are the implications of transnational aged care, which is just totally forgotten about uh, in many instances, where uh, you might have people preferring to seek help and resources from their country of birth rather than their country of settlement. We see that a lot with some Indian communities. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, what will happen in terms of aging preferences for second generation migrants uh, and their preferences for ethno-specific care as well. So these are some of the issues uh, we've explored in the papers. If you wish to read more, um, they are available online. Uh, here, here are the two papers that um, you can access. And thank you very much for your present, uh, for your time. And I will stop sharing my screen, and um, we can we can probably have a bit of time. Great. Well, thank you very much, Bianca and Joe. Um, we now have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions, uh, please submit them now through the chat function. Um, alternatively, if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can turn on your camera and microphone and we'll call on you in turn. So I believe we have already have a couple of questions come through. Uh, Bryony asks, did you find any differences between home and community care and residential care? such as a greater or lesser engagement with home care versus residential care? That was a question for Jo, just to yeah. clarify. <laughs> so, um, well, it's a bit hard to say really because um, we, um, the sample was, um, well, first of all, we interviewed carers um, and also service providers, but in terms of how they engaged, you know, to what degree they engaged with, um, age care versus, you know, um, residential age care versus uh, home care services, because they were at different level, uh, different points in their journey. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to say, but there were certain community differences um, uh, that definitely stood out in the carer interviews. Um, for example, the in the Arabic speaking community, um, very rarely, I can't think of one where they, one example out of, you know, our participants where they actually send their, their parent or their loved one to a residential aged care facility. And in fact, they didn't even really engage with home care services much either. So it was quite different um, in that across cultures, uh, whereas in the Chinese community, because they, and, and largely I feel it was because they had such good access to really wonderful services. 
um, that they were able to sort of get them to, you know, facilitate their um, home care service, but also the carers were provided with wonderful services. And, you know, they also have ESMO specific aged care facilities that is built and, you know, designed for the Chinese community. So, you know, they had all those things available. Did that answer your question, Rani? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I, the reason I asked was that I, some of my previous work has shown that people from some cold communities actually do use quite a lot of home care, but uh, resi care would be out of the question. Yeah, we did get some of that too. But as I said, look, I mean, you know, to, to give a, a hard and fast answer, because people were, as I said, at different points of the journey, um, you know, we did find that people were more reluctant to um, sort of use residential aged care if they had the choice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our second question is also from Bryony, this one for Bianca. She asks, are people from different countries experiencing aging differently, such as more or less access to services, more or less experience of dementia and more or less mental health issues? Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we see, uh, quite a bit of variation in um, aging experience and access to services by country of birth. And that's influenced in part by, um, I guess, the migration history. So communities that are established in, so established called communities, because by virtue of being in Australia for a long time and having lived in aged in Australia, they've set up services, um, mostly in metropolitan cities um, to, to meet their uh, requirements and need. However, um, more um, newer communities, especially ones that are still kind of aging into, into later life, uh, there are much fewer services available for them. They're more reliant on mainstream, um, I guess, care providers and uh, are less likely to access residential care services, for example. Uh, in terms of mental health uh, prevalence, we did some work around that um, a few years ago using ABS data, uh, and this was across the life course, not just uh, in older people. And we found, um, interestingly enough, that older, the prevalence of mental health, particularly depression, was something like three times higher in um, Middle East and North African communities compared to Australian born communities. And then after that came older Greek communities and then Indian communities. Um, I'm not quite sure why, there's such high rates of, of depression in, in those areas. We could hypothesize uh, that it might have to do with migration trajectories, such as whether they're a refugee or a humanitarian arrival and exposure to, to trauma. Uh, but it might also be other things such as uh, post-migration settlement factors, um, difficulty finding a job or experiences of discrimination, housing insecurity, et cetera. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Bianca. Uh, Luke comments, fantastic research. Thank you all for this great work. It has a question for Joe. Uh, do aged care workers need to have any formal interpreter training? In my area, we have an issue that we need level three interpreters, which are often hard to find and we can't get them for many languages. And we can't just use staff who speak the same language. Well, um, in terms of, I mean, Bianca might be able to add to this as well, because um, when we spoke about people who were working in aged care, um, those would be, uh, as an example, um, we interviewed people in a Chinese speaking nursing home where would, they would get workers who would just be speaking the language. Uh, they weren't formally trained interpreters, but they could help facilitate conversations with, you know, the residents and make them feel comfortable and happy in their activities. I think um, interpretation training probably is more of the diagnostic, uh, like at the, you know, get it when you're getting a diagnosis of dementia, it's quite important not to just get, you know, you know, your, your, your daughter or your son who might have grown up in Australia and, you know, I uh, may not know the, um, you know, uh, the language sort of well enough to, to be able to convey the, the diagnosis and also do it with the specific, specific, specificity you need to. Here comes my Danish into action. Uh, <laughs> Bianca, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so to answer your question, I think, yeah, we do. Some staff, um, maybe not, not, not uh, personal care attendance necessarily, but I think... 
um, staff that are certainly involved in um, care navigation and brokering access to care services um, do need some interpreter training uh, insofar as not that they do the interpreting, but they know how to work with an interpreter. And I think that's really important. Uh, the difficulty of finding interpreters in particular languages is um, precisely one of the things that I've outlined in, in the presentation is actually if you don't anticipate and plan, because you know, interpreters don't go on trees, you've got to train them uh, and uh, train them well. So we need to start building that capacity in anticipation of future need. And I think the last thing is, I think telehealth, um, you know, COVID's definitely forced us to, to undertake telehealth much more than, than perhaps uh, was previously done. Uh, and there is enormous potential in undertaking uh, telehealth or e-interpreting, which is some work Nari did a few years ago uh, and found that it was very cost effective and could be, um, did have a high degree of acceptance uh, amongst uh, staff, clinicians, older people and their family carers. Uh, provided, of course, the technology worked and didn't stuff up too much. Great. Thank you, Bianca and Joe. Uh, so Deborah asks, have you any indications if and or how predicted patterns um, of family support may change over time? Do you think that this could impact on future demands and planning? Uh, do you want me to go with that? I can, I can do that. Yes, I think it will. Um, we largely have, uh, in Australia, we've really got a nuclear family kind of arrangement. That's the way many of our homes are built and um, we don't really encourage intergenerational um, living. It's not sort of part of the, the kind of, I guess, the general culture in Australia. So I think um, with housing scarcity and um, smaller housing, that will shape uh, family formation and that will shape families' capacity to care for older people whether they're within the family home or whether they or the person lives independently. Um, in terms of how that's going to shape uh, care arrangements into the future, I, that's actually something we haven't thought about in terms of um, our demographic, in terms of our projections and modeling. So I'll take that question on notice as a, something for future research. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Can I, can I add to that as well? Because what we found, um, certainly just from observation across the different groups we spoke with, so we've spoken to nine different, you know, people from nine different language groups, was that, um, for example, in the, in the Indian community, for example, many have come, you know, just as a couple or, you know, they don't have the extended family here. So the care happens to fall on the one or two people who might be here. Whereas in the Arabic speaking community, in the Greeks, for many in the Greek speak, I mean, it was very, um, it was a significant trend in the Arabic community. They built up these, they, they came from fairly large families generally, and they built up these regimes of care around their parent so that, you know, little sister would go in the morning and then big brother would take over in the afternoon and they have WhatsApp groups and, you know, where they shared information about medication and care and problems during the day. Whereas for other people in across other groups where they might have a smaller family or family lived away, um, that became far more difficult. And I think as, you know, people migrate for economic reasons with, you know, the world gets smaller, um, but also bigger to some extent, you know, you, you, a lot of families are split up, so they don't have that large family. So that plays into Bianca's idea around the nuclear family as well, where that's becoming more common. Mm -hmm. Great, we'll move on to the next question from Joan. She asks, uh, to what extent does stigma play out in decisions about accessing services, including residential aged care? Massive, it's a really big issue. Um, First of all, I mean, look, residential aid, sorry, Bianca, you could jump in as well. But first of all, I mean, residential aid care doesn't have the, the, the best reputation. People tend to see, you know, all the terrible things that, you know, have been highlighted in the world mission and all that. But also, secondly, in many, at least many coal communities, there is um, a distinct, uh, I suppose, uh, imperative to care for your loved one at home. Uh, and, 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 and sending someone to age care is seen as a real failure on behalf of the family. This is not all groups and it's not everyone and everyone is different, but in general, there tends to be like, you know, why on earth would you ever send your, your mom or dad to a residential aged care? What sort of a person are you? Um, and I'd add to that, that stigma in the communities is layered. 
So you have uh, different kinds of stigma that converge. So there is a stigma around, there's cultural stigma. So, you know, that the idea of reciprocity that my parents cared for me, therefore now I must care for them. And how would I, um, residential aged care facilities are therefore a place of abandonment. So that's, you know, definitely out of the question. Uh, but related to that also is, I guess, a, a public perception of stigma. So, you know, how would my community perceive me um, if I were to, uh, put my older parent or relative into residential age care as well. So those are some of the stigmas. And then there's also stigmas around, uh, I guess, um, I won't even see when it, I think there's the legitimate and real concerns around um, putting someone into an age care facility um, if they're of a cold background and you know, how would they communicate linguistically? Would they get access to food? Cold communities are obsessed with food. So, you know, it's all about access to their right food. And you know, and culturally appropriate activities and those sorts of things as well. So it's layered in the and, and that was where, uh, as an example, one of the um, Chinese uh, residential aged care facilities that I visited, um, they really tried to, um, I suppose, um, address some of these issues, which is why they had an induction period and they had many, many meetings with the, with the families because they were very reluctant very reluctant to send their loved ones to an aged care facility. And they, they really did a lot of work to A, well, first of all, have the facilities and the, the services in place that were culturally appropriate and you know, lovely, but B, actually convincing and, and working with the families to, to make them understand that, you know, all of, you know, make them understand that their loved one would be taken care of in a, you know, the best possible way. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking Bianca and Joe with your clap reactions. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you very much for speaking today. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Kirsten Moore, who will be presenting pre-death grief and preparation for end of life in family carers of people living with dementia. Uh, so please join us next week on Tuesday, the 16th at midday. And thank you very much for attending our Seminars in Aging program.